Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matt, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Friends, Romans, and all countrymen, lend me your ears. Especially you Romans, you've got a lot to catch up on. It's time for you to relax and stretch out on the cubitum because you've got a loculus full of stories coming your way for this week here at Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. And here in his finest royal purple trimmed toga is our very own Ludi Magister. It's Matthew Dickerson. Ave, Matthew, ave. What am I stretching out on? An acubitum. Mm. It's a Roman couch. I'm not familiar with one of those. <laughs> I'll have to check out one of those. We're diving into the loculus. That's a satchel right. full of. If, you ju- if you're not speaking, you obviously don't speak much Latin then. I, I try not to oh, these well. days. Oh, fair enough. Okay, well, I'll see what I can educate you on through the rest of the course of this Excellent. episode. Thank you very much. Well, this week I've had an interesting experience about something that's staring us in the face. I went along and attended a function that had some of our community leaders speaking at that function. And of course, one of the topics that often comes up now when community leaders are speaking is our changing climate. They don't like to use the word climate change sometimes, but Mm. there's some recognition there's some change in our climate. Also some recognition that we're changing the way we might be producing our power in the future. Not for any reason related to climate change, but just there might (laughs) be some things out there that are changing. And one of the things that was fascinating was someone asked a question, someone from the audience asked a question about targets and how we're going towards our targets of, say, 2030 or 2050 and what the progress is. And if you're going to meet a target of 2050, you probably want to start taking steps earlier than that. And the answer that we got back was interesting but scary. The answer was, well, there's no targets until 2050, so we don't need to worry about it for the moment. So that was the first one that... Right. So you worry about it 2049 in about June. I think so. I think that's the idea. So superannuation, don't worry about your superannuation until the day before you need to draw your superannuation. Don't worry about putting it in early, for example. Mm. So don't worry about it for 2050, but... Sorry, what was the average age of the audience, can I say? Because uh, was that that a factor, perhaps? Um, (laughs) Don't worry about it because you'll be dead by then. (laughs) Well, maybe that was it. I didn't actually think about that, but maybe that was it. But the second part was the one that absolutely fascinated me. The solution to the problems that are in our climate, we don't have to worry about at the moment because there's some people out there in the technology field and some scientists, etc. they're pretty clever. You know what? They'll come up with a way to solve the problem. Sorry, they'll come up with a way in terms of future tense as opposed to now, present tense? <laughs> and I so wanted to put my hand up and say, you're absolutely spot on. And it's called wind turbines, it's called solar panels, <laughs> it's called electric vehicles. We've got the solution staring us in the face. Uh, but apparently at some point in time, there'll be another solution right. that scientists will come yeah, up with okay. that then this particular leader will accept as this is now the solution to solve the problem. Forget about the solutions that we've got already to mm. solve the problem. So it's a bit scary. It's and like searching for a cure for COVID and people saying, we've got this vaccine that's... <laughs> that's right. <It> seems <laughs> no, no, like... I want a cure. Okay. <laughs> it seems like we've got the solution kind of <laughs> under control if we take action about it. But it is a bit scary, isn't it? This, that denial process. And it's also a bit inconvenient. It's the... I've heard young people say it. I've heard, actually not my children, thankfully, but friends of my children say... Oh, well, that's a, let's say the name is John. That's a tomorrow John's problem. Mm, so, but what about yeah. doing something about it now to make tomorrow's John solution easier? Don't Some worry about it. Fancy tan, a tap dancing happening there, yeah? Mm, there is indeed. Oh. So we do, we do try not to talk about climate change too much on this podcast. It's all about technology, but it seems to be intertwined, but it does still seem like we've got well, some way to go. Well, technology is guided towards a more positive future, right? So building a positive future, and I think it's probably linked a little bit, wouldn't you say? I would say so, but I don't want to scare people off by saying right. the scary term climate change, and then yeah. everyone turns off. All righty, enough of this distractus. It's time for our first story. Just let me check. <laughs> Are we going to get Roman? More Latin. All the way through. <laughs> no, I think I'll draw a line under it right there. No, okay. no, I was, I was looking forward to <laughs> No, I, I, you, I've honestly, I've hit my limit. All oh, right. <laughs> All righty. A simple Android update has caused quite a bit of upheaval in the UK in recent weeks. The unassuming software update has seen a number of accidental emergency calls around the nation spike in a big way. Matt, a simple glitch made more complicated when people hastily hung up on the emergency operators at the other end. Let me just tell you a scary scary story first before we talk about this. My wife and I were sitting at home one day, innocently just 
doing some work or whatever it might have been on a weekend and we had a knock at the door. I opened the door to see two people dressed in blue. Now, I'm a fairly law-abiding citizen, so I didn't expect them to be here to arrest me. Mm. And I kind of wondered why they might be knocking on my door. And, of course, you start to think of your kids. Bad news. Yeah, that's yeah. right. What's, what's wrong, sir? Have you got a, no- a daughter named Georgina? Yes, we have. And you, your heart skips a few more beats. Well, we received a triple zero call from her and we can't contact her. And so, again, by this time, oh, you can well, imagine. even worse. Panicked parents. So we're trying to ring her immediately, ring some of her friends. Finally got hold of her, and it just turns out she'd been out of the races for the afternoon. She'd taken her small handbag that she put her phone in, and the phone had been resting against a certain part of a handbag that had caused a triple zero call to be made. Now, she was just having a good time with a handbag, not knowing that a handbag had made this call. And, of course, yeah. when they tried to ring, it was too noisy. They couldn't get hold of her, et cetera. So we come down when we finally realized it was all okay. But we found that interesting in the process they went through to try and find her. And that's exactly what's happening here. Android phones have had an update where it used to be the case that you could just hold down one button and make a triple zero call. And in this case, the story was about the UK triple nine call. But they've changed the software now. So exactly that. If you've got it in a pocket that might be too tight or a handbag or just resting in the wrong spot, they're getting these calls coming through. But the real issue is that when the call goes through, the person who realizes they've made the call hangs up because... That'd be yeah. my first reaction. Oh, yeah, that, absolutely. I'm oh, embarrassed. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm so embarrassed by this. That's right. And I don't want to occupy these people whose time is very valuable. Exactly right. So they're hanging up. But they said the triple nine call, uh, call operators in this case, are very diligent. So that could have been someone in an emergency. Yeah. Maybe it was a, a distress call because they've been kidnapped or they've yeah, only just needed to make it. they've got protocols that say you've got to try, try and chase this up a bit. That's right. And for every accidental call like that, they're taking about 20 to 30 minutes to actually find out whether it's legitimate or not. And obviously, and that's an average. Money. So for everyone that they can just call back and say, hey, did you mean to call this? That's right. They go, no, 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 I'm sorry, really sorry. There's got to be some that drag on for 40, 50 hour. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So they said at the moment, and a lot of this is put down in this Android update, 20% of all triple nine calls in the UK are accidental. And that's not the prank calls. I I still can't believe people make prank calls, but that doesn't include the prank call. So 20%. So that means you've essentially got to have a lot of extra staff on to be able to take those calls for the accidental calls that come through. So that's interesting. But what they've said, the the message they're putting out from this, and this would be the same across the world, whether you're in America with 911 or Australia with 000, wherever it might be, if you do make an accidental call, talk to the operator. You're not going to get in trouble. You're going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I've held that button down too long. I was trying to turn my phone off, whatever it might be. Really sorry, accidental. Are you sure you're okay, sir? You're not just saying this because you got someone with a gun at your head. No, no, it really is accidental. It's okay. So if they're satisfied it is accidental, then that's fine. It's all done. So you don't have to worry about wasting their time. So what was behind the update then? What was the update function? What what were people doing wrong to accidentally call nine nine nine? Well, it used to be. Well, you, you used to. In the old Android update or old Android software, you couldn't hold down the power button in a certain way to make a triple zero call. Right. Whereas now they've updated it to be a bit more like iPhones where you can just hold it down to make a triple zero call. Okay. So it was a change in that, probably to match the iPhone. Right. But essentially it was just to make it easier to call emergency services. And it is easier to call emergency services, yeah. which means people are sometimes doing it accidentally. Wow. So, and it's, it's actually hard for people that want to turn off their phone, like a, an iPhone for a long time, you had to hit the volume up, volume down power button to turn off your phone. Most people hit the power button, oh, that just locks the screen, hold the power button down. Mm. Well, it doesn't actually turn the phone off. That's how you can make an emergency call. So Yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Anyway, so if you do make an accidental call, stay on the line, talk to them, just sorry. Just have a chat. Take 10 seconds out of your day just to say it's, it's, it was a mistake. I'm an idiot. I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here's some solid advice for the technologically inept. People, 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 especially you Romans, pay attention to this. Predictable passwords are the first gift to the bad guys. The problem is that you don't think that you're important enough to warrant hacking. And that attitude is their second gift. Tell them that. Tell them all about predictable passwords. 13% of people still use one, two, three, four, five, six, ah. or password. Because no one would think 
yeah. of the word password as your password. Surely that would be – I've tricked them now. Well, I've they got think them. this site doesn't really matter, so Sorry. I'm just going to use a dodgy password. Now, some people are learning. Some people listen to your tech talk and they're learning don't use those passwords. But then they use other things that they advertise. So, for example, they use their pet's name, oh. 20%. 20% of Aussies use their pet's name. And what right. do you do with your pet? You have a picture on social media <laughs> with your pet. Look at Rover. Look at mm-hmm. Fluffy. And, of course, then someone says, gee, I'll try Fluffy as a password. Mm. Surprise, surprise, 20% of the time it works. And then derivatives, Fluffy01, <laughs> Fluffy02. And once you've got something to start with, you've got some simple little programs that will run through various derivatives, uppercase, lowercase, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. The other one is sports teams. So people have a photo in their Manly jersey and say, yep. go Manly tonight. And some people go, hmm, I wonder if Manly is going to be a password. Or pick your favourite player. Mm. I wonder if Cherry Evans is going to be a password in there. So it's pretty simple to advertise some of those things. My favourite way of going about something is the pass phrase. And the one that I always think of from school, for example, is remembering the order of the planets. We used to use my very elderly mother just saw Uncle Ned pass. That's back in the days when Pluto was still a planet. Yeah, we're not talking about Pluto anymore, are we? That's right. So Uncle Ned, he does nothing now. So he doesn't (laughs) pass, he does nothing. So Uncle Ned's been saved. (laughs) So that's a really easy way to remember a series of characters that if you just took the first letter of each of those words – It looks like a random jumble of characters, but if you have a passphrase to remember it by, it makes it really easy. So do something like that. Put some upper and lower case in there. Put some other characters. So just think of a sentence that has a number in it um, and uh, maybe needs an upper or lower case letter. And maybe you can even throw in one of the odd characters in there as well. That's right. Just pick anything above the numbers there, a dollar sign, a hash sign, whatever. So something like that. Now, the other thing that I say to people a lot is that there are a lot of people, 80% of acting people, use the same password across everything. And I get that because there are so many different accounts now. It's like I'm going to mm. this particular site. Oh, now what's my password for that one? So what do you do? You write them all down, stick them on your monitor, yeah. which just advertises <laughs> them to everyone. So some people have this process where they use the same password for everything. So there's two bits of advice I give there. One is if you're going to have a different password for something, make it your email account. Because what people are often doing is when they get into an account – and they would then want to reset the password to fa- effectively take that account off you, mm. they'll often get sent a password to your or a password reset to your email. If you've got a different email password, then it's a bit harder for them to get to your email as well as some of your other sites. So that's one thing. Mm. But the other way to do it is have a, a standard password you use, a passphrase or whatever, and then just have a couple of characters at the end or at the beginning that links to that site you're going to. Yeah. So you can keep the same one. It's a bit easy to remember the same. But then, oh, I'm going into my Wooble account. I'll use my standard password with W at the end. So yeah. it's still a different password for every site, and it just makes it harder. What you're trying to do is you're trying to make it obvious that your house has got some security on it and go to the next door neighbours, which doesn't have any security. So mm-hmm. they look at your accounts and try and break in. They give up and move on to someone else's account. And what about OneNote pages? And you can have a lockable page on a OneNote or a lock- lockable section. You could have a decent password on that perhaps, I wonder, and then store passwords on that or not. Yeah, certainly. And there are specific password programs mm. where you basically have one ridiculously difficult password to get into that program and then in that program you've got all your passwords for all your different sites so if you've got some way of doing that as well yeah. just make sure that first one whatever your it's a good first, password that's right it's a good password and it's a good site that you've got a lot of faith and trust in mm. that's not going to be attacked or hacked so it is complicated and it's a it's a scary world out there but still already this year this year calendar year We've lost $194 million through scams and hacking, Mm. and that's mainly attributable to weak passwords. Well, I also wonder, yeah, how much of that can be tracked to stolen identities as well, where people set up uh, a new credit card or whatever under someone else's um, details. Yeah, it it happens without a doubt. And probably they're the more sophisticated hackers, if I can call Mm. them that, while still being insulting to them in some way. But they're the ones that certainly... Uh, have got a bigger picture to play. A lot of the hackers want to use your account to send some information or maybe just steal mm. some information. But when they want to start taking your identity, that's when they're taking out home loans in your name and pocketing yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then you've got to start paying off that home loan. Thanks very much. Goodness me.
ChatGPT may be clever, it'll whip up a three-volume saga to rival the works of Tolkien, and it'll do it in three minutes if you ask nicely. It'll blurt out a comprehensive recount of the Punic Wars or, or run off a 2,000-word explanation on the role of plasma desmeter and plant cell biology, and it'll do it before you finish making a cup of tea. But get this, folks. Matt, you ready? Knock, knock. Who's there? Chat GPT. Chat GPT who? i got nothing. <laughs> and that's just like Chat GPT when it comes to writing jokes. Matt, apparently Chat GPT has no sense of humour. But it can convert things to Latin for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> so my favourite joke is the horse walking into a bar and the barman says, why the long face? Oh, I love this. <laughs> The problem here is that you want to start analysing jokes and that becomes a bit tedious. So take my favourite joke there, the why the long face barman joke. That's relying (laughs) on a few things. First, as soon as you say something walked into a bar, a man, an Irishman, a horse, an animal, whatever. Yeah, my brain's tuning for a joke. Correct. So that's that's Same with knock-knock, right? Exactly right. Step one, with a human, is... I'm into joke listening mode. Fantastic. The second part of that joke is there's a stereotype of a barman who always wants to hear your problem. So why the long Mm -hmm. face is obviously that thing, mate, you don't look very happy. What's going wrong with your life? So that's all implied just with that one short sentence. The third part is you need to be familiar with the fact that long face refers to someone that's looking sad. They're a bit down about life. And, of course, the fourth thing is, assuming you know some, something about the biology of a horse, which has a fair distance between the ears and the nose. So <laughs> you've, you've got all those bits put together, and then, well, why is it even funny? And that's the really interesting part about analysing jokes. In that particular case, it's that confusion between the long face meaning a long horse's face yeah. and the long face meaning sad. So there's a bit of ambiguity in there. And when you start to think about jokes, ambiguity, puns, homonyms, They're some of the common things that you have in jokes. So some researchers, I love researchers, the things they come up with. It's not not the answer that wins the Nobel Prize. It's It's coming up with a question. So researchers ask ChatGPT to tell a joke 1,008 times in a row. Why 1,008? Who knows? I have no idea, but that was the number they picked. And what they found was that 90% of the time, all ChatGPT did was produce a variation of one of 25 standard joke setups. It might have changed the players in the joke, but essentially that's all it did. And most of them were what I would call dad jokes. Okay. They were those poor puns or those right. homonyms. They weren't really clever or creative jokes. And the other thing that's really interesting is about, I think stand-up comedians do it well. You don't see many stand-up comedians that stand there and tell a joke with a punchline or mm. tell a knock-knock joke. Sometimes I might throw in that as part of it, but they don't really do a lot of that. What they tend to do is more that observational, relatable type humour. And it's, it's really interesting. When you start to talk about that, you start to talk about trying to have some form of relatable humour that is obvious when you hear it, but not so obvious that it doesn't make you think about it. It's kind of it's, – it's consciously noted by the audience – but not so obvious that it's really obscure. And so one of the things I I looked up when I was playing around with some research on this is the sort of joke, that sort of relatable joke that a friend tells you they struggled carrying 10 grocery bags in from their car after their last shopping expedition, but that was always better than taking two trips to the car with the groceries. Now, you you do that and you go, yeah, you're right, you know. I've done it myself. I've loaded up my hands with all these bags and all (laughs) uncomfortable squeezing in through the door. There's no way I was going to take two trips. So you have a bit of a chuckle about that because you can relate to it. But ChatGPT hasn't ever had to load up its hands no. <laughs> with groceries, so it can't write that sort of relatable humour. We've got so, to wait, wait a while for ChatGPT to get a bit of life experience, perhaps. <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. So it really is interesting. And there are some jobs that ChatGPT will take off humans. There's no doubt about that at all. Stand-up comedians, I think, are pretty safe for some <laughs> time yet because trying to write jokes around ChatGPT's background and research and data is actually really challenging. You've only got to do it yourself. Just go and ask whatever your preferred device is to tell you a joke, yeah. and it'll tell you a joke. But usually, most of the ones I've seen are those sort of bad puns. I haven't done it a thousand eight times in a row, I must admit. <laughs> but yeah, so much of comedy uh, relies on surprise mm. and, and subterfuge. And um, I, that's, a, that's a big stretch for, uh, for an artificial intelligence to sort of pick up on, to, to take a story down one way and then all of a sudden take a right-hand turn. Because it's not 
what you expect AI to do because it's not logical. It's not sequenced. Yeah, it's not right. something that and says... the lack of logic yeah, that is required. That's right. Air. I think we're digging too far deep into humour right now. Now we're going to make things unfunny. <laughs> well, well, I actually thought about that when I was, when I was kind of analysing that joke, the, the long face joke. I'm never going to laugh about that joke ever again. I'm well, sorry, I man. thought about that. I thought, I'm really sorry now as I've thought about it so much. Maybe it's not funny anymore. But the other one that I thought was a homonym that is this typical sort of joke that you hear is the the standard one again? I'll pick on the the into a bar joke. You know, a bear walks into a bar and says to the barman, "Please give me a beer." And the barman says, "Why the big paws?" And the bear says, "I don't know. I was born with them." <laughs> so again, that that <laughs> homonym of of the paws, p a u s e and p a w s. Yeah, that's the sort of joke I think that Chat GPT typically tells because it is a homonym or it's a pun, but it's not that observational type humour. So. Mm. I'm really keen to see the next bit of research we do around AI and humour and keen to see the next bunch of researchers that go and listen to a lot of well, jokes. Well, perhaps the next – well, if AI comes with up with some good jokes, perhaps that's the next step before we get the Terminator arriving and um, <laughs> I, the, la Vista, baby. And he's not really that funny, though, is he? He doesn't have many jokes. No, no he's it's not very about serious. the jokes. It's just about AI can do everything at that point. Yeah, right. And then the, the world's going to be destroyed. So we know once it comes up with good, clever, creative, observational jokes, we yeah. know as we're going hide in our We're bunker. at the end point. <laughs> Now, a logo is a significant piece of property for any company, large or small. They're protect, protected by trademark laws, and rightfully so. You'd surely agree. But it's is it okay for a company to own all images of an object to the exclusion of all other companies? The Swiss Fruit Union stumbled into an alligator-infested infested swamp when they decided to use an apple for their logo, an apple of all things. Matt, it's a logical and reasonable choice for a fruit co-op. Wouldn't you say? They've only been around for 111 years, so it's a bit rude really to uh, start saying you can't use a logo. Now, it is a newish logo, but they've had it mm. for a while. But it is one of those things, isn't it? Apple does... But does Apple own all apples? They would like to think so, yes. Mm. Yes, is the answer that their lawyers would give you. But they've done this before. They seem to get a bit antsy, Apple the company, not Apple the fruit. They seem to get a bit antsy about anyone doing anything that they think they can go and sue them for. And there are many mm. stories around where they've taken on some small little operator who started up some business and for some area they think it might just touch somewhere on Apple's... IP or one of their patents or their trademark or their brand, so they go on whack him with some lawsuits. And of course, a small operator gets a bit scared when yeah. Apple and their team of lawyers knock on their door and say, "Stop doing this." And most people just say, "Okay." But this is the Apple or the Fruit Union, so they're not just a little two-bit company. They're not someone who just says, "Okay, I'll get scared by your lawyers." They've said. No, damn it! <laughs> we've we've got a <laughs> logo, lost. and it's Apple. got an that's right. It's got an apple in our logo. And we don't have a problem with that because we deal with fruit. So this has been going on since about two thousand and seventeen, and it's quite a different looking logo as well. You would say, obviously, yes. It's not like it's a copy of the Apple logo with a slight change or something. It is quite different, and I think sometimes people there are some absolute. Apple fans out there, some mm. people who love Apple, but even for some of those, sometimes they say, you know what, sometimes Apple's a bit of a bully. <laughs> and I get the feeling that's exactly the case here, that they're just trying to be a bit of a bully, and maybe they just want us to talk about it on podcasts so that it keeps progressing the Apple brand name in general, but it just seems like, pull your head in, will you? And there's 8,000 farmers out there that this Swiss group represents. Surely, surely it's not too bad to let them have their Apple on their fruit branding, and you go and have your apple on your branding of technology, they don't seem like they're really competing against each other. Well, perhaps you've got something there. Perhaps they make a bit of a stink about it just to raise it to the public eye, and then they back off and go, oh, look, we're backing off. Aren't we nice people? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's be. the strategy. Wait, watch this space, folks, and see what happens. Mm. In an effort to push the world towards a more sustainable future, the EU has an ena enacted a new law to reduce e-waste and ensure that batteries in phones are 100% replaceable. Matt, a step in the right direction, surely. When I go back to the old days, James, when we used to have the flip phones, flip phones often, but various phones, you pop the back off and replace the battery. In. Yeah. 
one of the biggest accessory sales that we used to have in one of my businesses was batteries. Mm. So we sold a lot of batteries. We sold more batteries figure, than huh? cases or chargers or anything else. It was a really good source of revenue. Then when they started bringing out phones that were completely sealed, we went, oh, no, that's terrible for us from mm. a profitability perspective because we're not going to sell batteries anymore. And it does seem like you get to the point where your battery is not working great in your phone. You've worn out the battery as such. And so you go, oh, it must be time to replace the phone. Mm. And, of course, there's a perfectly good phone that's still working. Put a new battery in it. will probably keep working for a few years yet. But it ends up in the bottom drawer. It ends up going into some recycling or maybe even a landfill somewhere. And the EU have actually done quite a good job with a few things, haven't they? They've been pretty good around USB-C to say let's have a common charger. They've also been pretty good around taking charging bricks out of packaging of every new phone that's sold because most people have got the charging brick. Mm. So let's not just keep land, keep filling up landfill with charging bricks. And so this is the latest they've done that they're saying that you're going to have to have phones that can just have a simple replaceable battery, use a replaceable battery. Now It just seems like common sense. It does. I'm sure But the does it affect the waterproofing maybe? That's right. This oh, is the right. thing. Sorry if I jumped I'm, in there. No, no, that's fine. Yeah. I'm I'm sure that the manufacturers will say that they can't do that because how can they give it the same IP67 or IP68 mm. standard or, or it's not waterproofing, water resistance, water sta- resistance uh, right. standard when you've suddenly got this replaceable component on there. Now, I'm sure they can work out a way around that. I'm sure they can build it so that you can replace it and then put it back on and it seals tight enough that it'll be okay. But that would be their first argument because, of course, the manufacturers would prefer that you do have to replace your phone when the battery wears out. They don't necessarily make as much money out of a battery as they do out of a phone. But, again, this is where the EU is going in terms of trying to change what we're doing across the world. The logic from the EU is if we do it across the EU, then probably phone manufacturers are not going to build an EU-specific phone and then a rest of the world phone. It's just too complicated in the manufacturing process. And we'll see that in September this year, I think we'll see the first evidence of that when Apple will announce their latest version of their iPhone, which all the experts are saying that will have USB-C on it. I don't think they're going to have a USB-C European phone and a lightning everywhere else phone. So that'll be interesting to see which way they go. But this is the same with here, that we'll see some changes there. There's a few other things. By 2030, the EU wants to increase the battery collection rates from its current 45%, which I think is not too bad in terms of recycling. Mm. They want to get it up to 73%. Now, I don't know what that's a nice round number, isn't it? It's a strange <laughs> one, isn't it? But that's that's where they're focused on that. And so they've got a few things in place there to try and change what we're doing across the world and be more environmentally friendly. So I think congratulations to the EU for some of their steps. And some of these steps are big steps. And you can imagine we've got companies like Samsung and Apple who want to go along and make sure that they get their way in some of these. So they're taking on some pretty big companies, but good luck to yeah. them. Come a long way in terms of public health since since the 1980s when the removal of lead from petrol kicked in. Here are two interesting facts for you. The last time you could buy lead petrol here in Australia was as late as the 31st of December 2001. Now that surprised me. And you can still buy leaded petrol in six countries around the world and they're mostly in the Middle East, but surprise, surprise, also in North Korea. Now, losing lead out of petrol has cleaned up the air markedly and people are better off as a result. But we're we're still pumping out carbon monoxide, various toxic hydrocarbons and large particulates with every car trip running on an internal combustion engine. So imagine the improvement in public health when we're finally all 100% EV. Matt, is that going to happen? One of the interesting arguments I have with friends of mine sometimes around various ways we produce power and various ways we propel cars is the climate change argument is there, but then I finally think I get somewhere in the argument when I talk about pollution. Mm. In other words, would you rather have a coal-fired power station next door to you spewing out pollution or some wind turbines? And of course, people go, well, yeah, I might like the look of wind turbines, but surely it's got to be better. 
And same with car. Would you rather be sucking on the end of a tailpipe when you're out <laughs> walking the streets or sucking on the end of a car that goes and drives on batteries? So it seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Oh, look, I used to walk up Parramatta Road uh, a bit uh, while I was living in Sydney in the mid-90s. And, um, yeah, just it would sting your nostrils after a while and you'd have a bit of a headache. You'd just feel doughy. Yeah, um, yeah Parramatta Road being a pretty busy sort of stretch of road. Uh, but, um, you yeah, know, this is when leaded petrol is well and truly on its way out. <laughs> So it wasn't just lead that I was absorbing. Yeah. <laughs> you were probably saying a bit of lead and a bit of carbon monoxide and everything else. But it is, I actually noticed it because we live in a regional area. I notice when I go to somewhere like a Sydney or even overseas, if I go to an LA or a Beijing, I actually do notice the first couple of days, I actually feel short much. of breath. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so we often talk about EVs from a climate change perspective, but the American Lung Association has done some research on what the pollution is doing from a health perspective. And I thought, this is fantastic. Thank you, American Lung Association. It's another angle, and this is absolutely fantastic. So they've done a calculation, and they said, if you could just flick a switch. Now, this isn't going to happen, but it it was done to demonstrate why we should be heading down this path. They said, if you flick a switch today, and you said, that's it, I'm going to change all cars to EVs, I'm going to change all power production to non-fossil fuel power production, so it might be nuclear, wind, solar, etc. And if you did that immediately in one hit, jump to the year 2050, what have you done? What what change have you made in society by doing that today over the next 27 years? And they said from a health perspective only, nothing to do with climate change, just from what's in the air, you would save 89,000 lives and wow. one trillion dollars in health costs alone. Yeah, right. It's fairly significant, is it? Now, obviously, we're not going. You, you can't flick a switch and say everything change tomorrow to be suddenly EVs and and all green power being produced. But it gives you an idea that it's not such a bad path to head down mm-hmm. if we can start heading in that direction as soon as possible and get to that point where the whole country is run on EVs and clean power. That's going to make a fair difference to our health. We're not going to save 89,000 lives because obviously as you go forward, it's going to take time to change over there, but we might be able to save 50,000 lives, Mm. 40,000 lives. I remember reading a study out of the University of Chicago over a year ago that said that air pollution created by the burning of fossil fuels reduced the global life expectancy of each person by 2.2 years. Now, there are other factors at play, but if it was just done on the pollution, you've got a fair difference in life expectancy. So that's quite incredible. So when you look at this sort of data and you have all your arguments against EVs for a whole range of other reasons, there's another reason now to look at EVs, and that's from a health perspective, protecting Mm. the health of everyone across the world. So it's quite fascinating. And I like like the attitude the American Lung Association has gone down to try and look at this. I'm sure they're still working on people with smokes and vapes, but that's a couple other issues there. But well, at least with this, you can... saving of a trillion dollars is a substantial thing, a bit of lunch money for everyone, a bit of extra lunch money. And one of the things that often is talked about with our, I like to call it the, the new economy, is as we move over to this whole new way of producing power, this whole new way of, of powering our nation, then people often talk about the cost of that. But then you look at this and you say, well, Maybe we should flip that around. Maybe we could save money yeah. by electrifying everything rather than actually the cost of it. And there's a health cost, which I must admit, I don't think about when I talk about climate change and talk about the change we should be having. I don't start to say, but what about the health costs? I'm thinking of a whole range of other issues, but it's a really good point that well, made. We used to talk about a lot more. I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, we used to talk about smog and uh, photochemical smog in particular. Right. The, yeah, the big thick stuff that looks really smoky. Uh, yeah, um, we don't talk about it so much anymore because the air has cleaned up a bit there, but we've still got a way to go. And there's new standards, obviously, with cars. They've yeah. got uh, catalytic converters. Yeah, and, as you said, sure. They've had lead taken out of them. So a whole range of changes there. So it's better, but it's still not as good as it could be. The ocean cruise industry cops a fair bit of flack from the environmental groups, and probably fair enough too. It's hard to argue how a 10-day cruise with 3,000 to 10,000 of your best friends all tightly packed together, each looking for their dose of opulence and rare experience, how can you balance that with anything environmentally sensitive? But at a time when the call to start healing the planet is finally taking heed in many industries, the cruise industry, with their backs to the wall, are starting to respond. And Matt, it's no surprise that the Scandinavians are stepping up to the plate. 
What would we do without the Scandinavians? <laughs> <laughs> what would we do without people in Norway they and Sweden? They feature a bit, <laughs> they don't do they, uh, yeah. uh, in, in this uh, new way of thinking and taking something that looks really bad and finding a way to, to fix it up. Well, I think one of the things, maybe they're a lot cleverer than the rest of us, because I think one of the things that they see when they talk about, when we talk about this whole new economy and the new world order, is opportunity. Mm. And I think they're trying to grasp this opportunity and be all over it. And this is a great example of it. Now, this has got... This is a cruise ship, 500 guests, 135 metre long, so a smaller cruise ship. I've been on various cruise ships, and that sounds a bit smaller than some of the ones I've been on, but it's a pretty popular industry, the cruise ship industry. I don't have the data to say how many cruise ships are running around the world at any given point in time, but mm. I think it's approximately a lot. Mm. And you've got a lot of people that love cruise ship holidays. It's people that yeah. that's their preferred holiday. But obviously it seems somewhat, apart from the leisure aspect of it, somewhat pointless. You build a big ship, use lots of resources, you stick it out in the water and you go from A to B just to have people going from A to B. It's not not taking product from A to B. It's not doing anything else. That's right. And there's a lot of waste that's generated uh, just in the transportation. So you've got to burn a lot of diesel there. Um, And then there's all the other waste that people are manufacturing. And and so, yeah, that's got to be dealt with as well. Yeah. So so. this this whole design for this ship is designed literally from – the ground up, or let's go below the ground from below water up. So the first thing they do is they put an advanced hull coating on that is slipperier through the water. So oh. straight away, less friction through the water, so that's good, less power to drive it through the water. They've also got a proactive hull cleaning technology, so it's not just day one when it goes in the water and that's slipperier and then six months later it's just the same as a normal ship, so they've got this process where they clean the hull a little bit differently. They've got propellers that are designed to be more efficient, contra-rotating propellers that are designed to be more efficient. Look that up, folks. (laughs) And I'm not exactly sure why specifically they are more efficient than a normal propeller, but they're saying that the research they've done is that they've got more efficiency out of their propellers. I wonder if that means that they're spinning in opposite directions, and so it's creating more turbulence in the water, so there's more things to grab hold of to push back. I don't know. Interesting. But it's interesting. Yeah. They've also got retractable thrusters, so when it's coming to dock, it makes it a bit easier to dock, and then they retract so they're not dragging, not giving you some extra drag on the hull itself. And then you've got AI, of course, not to tell jokes, not to t- <laughs> not to tell all the guests on there some new knock knock joke, but they've got some AI joke. Sorry, not AI jokes. They've got some <laughs> AI manoeuvring capabilities built into the actual ship itself, and then of course it's all powered by electric motors and batteries. So they've got some sixty megawatt hour batteries that are there. They're designed to recharge while the ship is docked, and obviously with cruise ships. They are docking regularly. So cruises that I've been on typically might go out to ocean for half a day, maybe a day, and then they pull in another port because it gives you a chance to go and look at that new port. So it's Mm. not like a freight ship where it goes load up here, spend a week out at sea or two weeks out at sea, and then dock wherever you're getting those containers unloaded. It is docking regularly, so it does give an opportunity to plug in and charge up. But then on top of all of that, you've got three retractable sails, each one of those is 50 metres high and about 1,500 square metres of solar panels. Now, we did do a story recently where we had a single sail that was popping up to help push a ship along, and that could be retrofitted. This is built from the ground up with these three sails, so they do both. They allow it to be pushed along by the wind as well as the contra-rotating propellers, but also they've got solar panels to keep charging their battery up. So they've kind of done very impressive everything they can think of at the moment. Now, we can't go on this cruise ship today. It won't be sailing until the year 2030. The design work has essentially been done. They're finalising that. They'll get some investors to come along and they'll actually build that ship with all of this technology built in and then say, right, let's go and and sail off. Now, again, building a ship is not a quick thing and with some of this technology, it probably makes it a bit harder to get it up and going quickly. But it does sound like it's a pretty good move in the right direction because, let's face it, if we changed all those cruise ships over to some sort of net zero process, then that sounds like a pretty good thing. Yeah. Are you familiar with chasing cars? Just to clarify, I'm not talking about any crazy canine fantasies you've got. This is about our very own car review platform right here in Australia, one that prospective car buyers might draw on to help make the best choice for themselves. 
There's a pretty big need for this service, as you might imagine, with a very broad market to scan, and the advice needs to come at a very personal level, of course. It's not an easy task, sharing well-considered unbiased advice on car buying. So, Matt, how is Chasing Cars streamlining their service today? If you are looking for a new car, this is a free plug for them. Just go on Google Chasing Cars and have a look at it, and it's really well done. Normally, if you're looking for a new car, and there are so many choices, even though we only sell a million cars a year in Australia, there's still a lot of choices in the Australian market. Mm -hmm. So people go along and they Google uh, SUV or a sedan and they look at the various options. But the problem is that you look at the options on one manufacturer's site and they present the information to you in some way, some form. It's being sold to you. It's being so sold to you. That's there, right. right. And then you go and look at another site, but the information is presented differently. So trying to get a really good comparison is difficult. The one manufacturer might say, compare these various vehicles that you might be looking at from the one manufacturer. But when you're trying to compare different brands, it's pretty hard. So some Australian entrepreneurs have come up with the idea of saying, well, let's give it the chat GPT treatment. So they've got chasing cars GPT. They're using the, <laughs> the engine, if you like, yeah, okay. of chat GPT, but they're taking all this information and they're saying, just type in what you're after. So as an example, I'm after a small SUV. What are my options out there? And it will give you a summary of some of the options, but then it will say, what are you looking for in particular? Are you looking for the space that you can store things or fuel economy or number of seats or what are you looking for? So then you narrow it down. And so then you start to get to the point where you say, I'm after an SUV that I can carry so many litres in or it's got so many many litres of space and that can sit seven people comfortably. And so then it narrows it down. It goes and takes all the information they can find out there on the internet and brings you back a summary and gives you some information about those various ones. So yeah, I, right. I tried it for a few different ones and it was it was quite good. It Cuts gave down me, the window shopping by far. It does, exactly right. And this is where you start to see the power of AI because when you're looking for a car, it takes you a fair bit of time and then you finally get to the stage where you want to go and look at the vehicles. And if you're going to go and look at a bunch of different dealers, it takes a lot of time. But if you've narrowed it down with some desktop analysis, you can just go and look at the, the last couple you've narrowed it down to. But it is a really good idea to use that sort of AI to analyse and give you information. So again, we talk about things that AI is great at and things that it's not so great at. This sort of analysis, dragging information together, giving it to you in an easy-to-read format is exactly its strength. Well, one of the things I found very frustrating um, when we were looking to buy our last car, or the car before the last one, I should say, um, was that um, you'd go into a dealer and you'd have some specifics that you wanted to work with and um, they didn't quite have what you had, so they then went into action to try and sell me something that I really didn't want, was, yeah. was almost what I needed but not what I wanted. And so this is a way of cutting that out, yeah? It cuts that out. And you can also ask for other things. You could say... Give me the sales number. So you Talk might think cup holders. Cup Sorry. holders. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I didn't try cup holders, but I have total confidence that you could say, I'm after an SUV and I want them ranked with the number of cup, cup holders, holders in each one. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the sort of thing you could ask for. Because trying yeah. to find that on the brochures from all the different manufacturers, it's way down the bottom of the list somewhere. Most people don't realise the importance of the cup holders, as you do. <laughs> <laughs> when you've got kids. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> and when you drink a lot of alcohol when you're driving. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> James doesn't do that. But it's one of the things that I just think it's a really clever use of that type of AI to analyse that information and give it to you in the format that you want it in. And then you can say, for example, well, I, I don't want to buy a car that, no one else is buying. So give me the sales numbers of all the SUVs in this category or give me the, the last three years worth of sales numbers or give me the accidents they've been involved in. Mm. I don't know about that one. I didn't try it. But that's mm. if the information's out there, it can, can gather it together. It, you can ask it. Yeah, exactly right. So well done to those guys. Ever wish you could just cut ties and go completely off the grid? Well, quite a few New New South Welshmen are are wishing they could, given the current situation. Being connected to our state's electricity grid comes with quite a cost today. Well, in a land far, far away from the home of the hippie movement in the 1960s, alternative communal living is making a comeback in California. I'll say that again. California is what I meant to say. A solar-powered microgrid community has kicked off and affordable, consistent power is their bag. Matt, we've talked about the potential for this here in Australia before. How are they faring in Shadow Mountain, California? I love it. 
I want to move to Shadow Mountain. I don't really want to move to America, but I want to move to Shadow Mountain. Just wondering how much solar power they're generating there in Shadow Mountain. (laughs) It's maybe poorly (laughs) named. Maybe they're Aussies are really good at naming things. Obvious. I always use the example of Shark Bay. We're in a bay. There's some sharks. What could we possibly call this place? How about Shark Bay? Shadow Mountain presumably has got some shadowing, but maybe that means there's some sun on the other side of Shadow Mountain. Maybe they're on the sunny side Mm. of Shadow Mountain. But at this stage, they've got 43 all-electric, solar-powered smart homes connected together. The plan is by next year they'll have 219 homes connected together, including a 2.3 megawatt-hour community battery that will be installed as part of that. That's awesome. And I, I get excited by this, but I don't quite understand how you would do it in a retrofit environment. This is a whole new environment, so that mm-hmm. makes it a bit easier. So purpose-built. Purpose-built. So essentially what happens is – Everyone that joins into this community, into Shadow Mountain, the first thing they do is they've got to sign up to the smart grid as part of what they're doing. So they have some solar panels put in their home. Great. A hundred percent of homes in there will have solar panels. That's fantastic. Each one will have their own battery in the actual home. Sometimes not too big. For example, one example I look at there seem like most of the homes have got a 13 kilowatt hour battery. And then they'll be connected to other homes, which sounds a bit Stalkerish, <laughs> funny. No, it sounds communal, and and for a bunch of ex hippies to design this, I reckon it sounds just like yeah, par for the course. Who says they're ex hippies? They could still be hippies. Well, uh, yeah, fair enough. Has hippies got a, a timeline on it? Does it have to be back in the sixties? Well, I'm just hippie? imagining a bunch of people who now dress a lot more neatly, and uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, got nice haircuts and stuff like that too. And they've got a, a lovely band around their ponytail. But an idea um, for technology. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. So you then connect these homes together and the community battery is an important part of it. And then what happens is it all comes down to the communal use. So when you've got solar panels on your home and then you might put a battery on your home, well, it's relying on just what you can produce and just what you use. But when you connect 43 or 219 homes together and add a community battery in, what you do is effectively you're using your solar panels to charge your battery while you're not using it. If you're using it, you're using your own power. Mm -hmm. But if you're using more than you can produce or more that's in your battery, for example, you tap into the community battery. When you're not there and you're producing too much power, then you're obviously feeding it back into the community battery. Mm -hmm. So the idea is at no point in time do you need to go to the external grid. Now, it is still connected to the external grid, so there's still a connection there. But the connection logically would be to the community battery rather than have 43 or 209 individual connections because you pay a connection fee just on a per day charge to be connected to the grid. So you do all of this. So in that whole group of houses, there's probably going to be someone on holiday sometime. So they're producing lots of electricity through their solar panels. Normally that'd be going nowhere because they're not home. They're not able to use it, but it's going back into the community battery. So you can use some of that power. So it sounds like a really good idea. And it just sounds like the uh, far right are going to throw up their arms about socialist uh, behaviours <laughs> and, and invade this place and, and bomb it to the ground. Well, um, possibly. I hope, hopefully not. Well, and one of the things, when I looked at one in particular example with one of the, the people in here, they built it. They haven't actually gone for lots of smart devices in their home. They haven't hooked up Alexa to turn the lights on and off and all sorts of things because that's what people think of when they think of smart homes. Mm. It's really a smart home in relation to their power and the way they share and use their power. So all that's good. Now, you still have meters on your home because if you're a really heavy user, you've got lots of kids at home or you run or you work from home, for example, you're using more power. It's still fair and reasonable that you pay for some of that electricity. If you're Mm. drawing more from the community battery than you're putting into it, then you'll still pay. But this example of of one particular couple, they said they got their first bill after two months in this community. It was 30 bucks. That's not too bad. It's a couple. I don't know how heavy on power they are. But because you've got this whole area there trying to work within itself to produce and use the power, you're probably going to get lots of examples. There might be some people who are always at work all day. Mm. So they're not at home. They're producing all this power going into the grid. As said, people on holidays, you might get other people to work from home, so they're using a bit more. So you're really just sharing this whole community existence. I think it's a great idea. It is. Now, we've talked there's a little bit about this in Australia. There's a few communities that are looking at this. There's a community battery we've talked about before down near Canberra. So there's some little bits and pieces there, but I think a lot of what I've seen so far in Australia has been trying to retrofit, which sounds a whole lot harder mm. than building it from the ground up. Mm. I think there's still capability to do that, but 
once we see a few new communities being built like that, I think that some people will say, oh, how we go about retrofitting right. ours? Yeah, yeah, and probably good. finding somewhere for the community battery as well. Can I just drop that in your backyard? No, put it in your backyard. So <laughs> that's another potential problem. You might need to find some public land yeah. in a community common area, space. common space to put it in. Okay, folks, it's time to pack them, rack them and stack them. That's it for another episode. Thanks for another cracking tech talk, Matt. You got any Latin to finish off with us, please? No Latin. Um, but I'm off to have a chat with my neighbours about going in together for one of those big batteries. I think um, if they're not fully into it, maybe I'll try burning a little incense. <laughs> maybe crank up some sitar music. See if that'll bring them around. And offer them what's the Latin couch? <laughs> the acubitum. That's right. Offer them that. That will get them over the line. I hope my pronunciation's right for any ancient Romans out there. Thanks for finding us once again, folks. We're so glad that you've joined us again for another Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. It's our pleasure to bring you all the latest news of the future week after week. I'm James Eddy, and all things being equal, we'll be back with another episode in one week's time for you, your family, your friends, your co-workers, and any casual associates that you mention to our little cosy podcast uh, too. Thanks for tuning in. Peace out, dudes. Thank you.